Welcome to Book Club Preview. I'm Michael, and today we're looking at Charlie Thorne and the Lost City, starting a new book in the Charlie Thorne series. And uh, we're going to look at the prologue and chapter one of part one, The Edge of the Earth. And for some reason, I feel like it's Edge of the World, but <laughs> we'll figure that out later. It starts off with the prologue. Um, there's a friend of Darwin, I, I forgot his name, ah, Fitzroy, um, Robert Fitzroy, who is waiting on his ship, and he's waiting for Charles Darwin, and he's been waiting for 10 months, 10 months for Charles Darwin. They had gone into the city, and Darwin had was supposed to get off for one month. But then he said that was going to be three months. And so then they left. They went around for a while, came back after three months. And Charles Darwin said, it's going to be three more months. They went back. It's going to be three more months. And so they've been waiting for 10 months. And, uh, and the crew of the ship is not happy at all. But finally, Darwin should be here. And <clears throat> he's three hours late. <laughs> Fitzroy is pretty upset. Um, he he had Charles Darwin come along uh, for several reasons. One, Charles Darwin was very, very wealthy, or at least his family was very wealthy. Fitzroy thought about leaving Darwin a few times, but his family was too powerful, and oh, he would get in real big trouble if he left him. And the second reason was because uh, Fitzroy wanted someone to talk to. Um, Charles Darwin was kind of upper class and Fitzroy was upper, upper class and he wanted someone to ride the boat with him uh, because all the boat uh, workers or sailors were lower class. And so he wanted someone that's at my level, good man. <laughs> and so, uh, so Fitzroy is pretty bored uh, just spending an extra 10 months um, sailing around this same area waiting for Darwin. But he suddenly hears shouts. <gasps> hey, hey, come on, let's go. And running <laughs> on the dock through this fog. And first of all, he's kind of looking out. And what, what is that? Who is that? I hear <gasps> Darwin. Oh, man, he's a little bit angry, but he's a little bit shocked because Darwin looks like a savage. His beard is grown out. His clothes are covered in dirt, and they're kind of ripped and tattered, and his hair is all everywhere, and his face looks dirty, and it's nighttime, so he probably can't see that well, but this does not look like the Charles Darwin he came in on the boat with. In fact, he looks worse than uh, the, the natives uh, that are on the island. But Charles Darwin is shouting, Get the boat ready! Get the boat ready! We have to leave! We have to leave right now! What the? What's going on here? Well, Charles Darwin starts coming up and... Behind him are two, um, what were they, Inca? Inca runners, I guess, uh, Inca natives, that were carrying uh, this huge chest. And they're running behind Charles. And so they kind of get up and, what, what is that thing? What, what, Charles, what, what is that? What are you bringing on board? Charles, I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. We gotta go, we gotta go, come on. Now, <laughs> Fritzroy figured he thought that the sailors would be pretty angry with Charles because they were this close to um, killing um, Fritzroy and taking the ship themselves. But um, looking at Charles, how he looked and everything that was going on and his panic and excitement, um, they just they just kind of got ready. And Fritzroy commanded him, let's go, men, let's go, we're leaving. And he really wants to know what's in that treasure chest or that log really 
But Charles is like, oh, I'll tell you when we get going. Let's go. We have to go. We have. I'll tell you later. Come on. And so Fritz Roy says, okay, fine. And he commands everyone, and they start sailing off and getting ready to leave. But as they're getting ready, Fritz Roy can hear something in the distance. Ah, ah. This sound of a whole bunch of people, and he can see some lights peering through the fog. And, oh, he gets a hint that uh, there are a lot of people coming to kill, take, fight, and do something to Charles, Darwin, and probably his friends too. And so they rush to get ready to leave. And finally, they start sailing off into the ocean. And now, when they're safe and free, uh, Charles starts to talk like his normal self. Oh, good man, look at this. I can't believe I found it. <laughs> well, I don't know how he sounds. But he, uh, he shows himself, oh my goodness, this is the greatest thing I've ever discovered. <sighs> he opens it up. And uh, Fritz Roy, he kind of, <gasps> wow, that's amazing. Okay, Charles. But inside, he's thinking, <gasps> oh, what is this? Oh, this is the most disturbing, terrible, awful thing I've ever seen. And he knows that he has to throw it overseas um, before anyone else sees it. He calls it an abomination, this terrible thing that should never have been created. Um, and yeah, that's how the prologue ends. And so hopefully we can figure out what this thing is, which leads to my discussion question, but I'll talk about that later. Chapter one flips over to Charlie Thorne, who is swimming with a bunch of hammerhead sharks. One of them in particular is nine feet long. That's three meters. Just swimming beneath her surfboard. But Charlie's pretty smart. She doesn't freak out. She remains calm because she is super, super intelligent. Maybe even the smartest person ever to have been born. And so the shark goes in and Charlie just relax. Says, hey, it's okay. This shark's not going to eat me. But she knows that hammerhead sharks usually swim in schools. And so then here comes more <laughs> hammerhead sharks swimming underneath her. And at this point, Charlie knows that they're probably just going to go eat the seals um, off, off to the side. But uh, one of those sharks could accidentally decide to try and uh, eat her. So she decides to get out of there and starts swimming over to, uh, to this wave. Now, Charlie has become a perfect surfer. She can calculate the mathematical numbers of the arcs and the waves and the wind and the trajectory and it all just visualizes to her in her mind as numbers and she always can find the perfect spot to surf down a wave and so she gets that spot and hits it perfectly and slides through the tunnel of the wave and doesn't even like have to duck down but just is riding her surfboard standing up the whole time and just coast right on to the beach and when she gets on the beach, everyone is like, oh, perfecta, oh, perfecta. And uh, that's kind of the, uh, I guess, nickname that the natives have called Charlie. But Charlie has been telling everyone that her name is Marisa Poza Espina. And uh, she's pretending to be one of the natives um, in the area. Actually, because she has kind of mixed blood, Asian and maybe a little African and European and um, all sorts of different things. I'm not sure what they were exactly. It was in the first book, but her family's mixed. And so her features almost look like any culture in the world. And because she's been here in this town, uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of pronunciation, uh, Isla Isabella. 
which is maybe the island Isabel. But in any case, she is, um, she's been on this island for four weeks, I think, and her skin is tan, tan, dark, and rough. And so she probably looks like one of the natives, and she certainly runs around like one, and she knows a whole bunch of different languages. In fact, in one day, she pretended to be like Thai and uh, European and uh, just a whole bunch of different nationalities all in one different day. And everyone was like, hmm, interesting, okay. But she's been hiding on this island far off, um, pretending to be this person that she's created. The island that she's on only has about 2,000 people. And it's part of the Galapagos Islands. It's a small, small island town um, that doesn't actually have a lot of fresh water either. But it's kind of off in the middle of nowhere. And so Charlie kind of feels on this island that she's actually at the edge of the world. Because if uh, while she was surfing, if the ocean had whoosh, carried her away, she would have been 9,000 miles from any other piece of land. So she's in a kind of a really special area of isolation. But there are people here. And, uh, and that's where she lives. That's where she's been living. Now, as she gets her surfboard and she starts walking to her home, she's feeling pretty good about herself. She hears this, wow, a really loud sound of a motorboat. And she looks down back at the pier and this super high speed boat pulls up to the dock. Now, boats coming to the town aren't that um, special. Sometimes tourist boats come for people want to look at some are the cool ecological things at the Galapagos Islands. But this is a speedboat, a millionaire's boat. And that's a little weird, but hey, not, not too weird. But she keeps going and then, oh, now that is weird. She sees this woman sitting at her house. Well, it's her rental, but her rental house, sitting in a rocking chair, reading a book hmm now Charlie's calculating the odds what are the odds that this boat and this woman would appear on the same day at the same time and she'd be at my house <sighs> something is wrong her spider senses are tingling <laughs> if you like spider-man and uh, so she's a little bit worried that um, some enemies found her or some people found her but she's not panicking yet and she's just being cool and she goes up to um, Esmeralda who Esmeralda introduces herself I'm Esmeralda Castle and it sounds like she has a slight accent so English isn't her first language and uh, she says that um, Charlie sometimes volunteers at this um, uh, this center to help the tortoises on the Galapagos Islands and all the workers there had recommended to Esmeralda um, Charlie to help her break a code. A code? Now, yeah, Charlie has been doing codes and cryptograms and stuff during her free time while she's been volunteering at this little tortoise shelter or whatever. But um, that's weird that this scientist, who we find out is some scientist or researcher, um, needs a code broken. She says, yes, we found a code scratched in to a tortoise shell. Um, okay, that's weird. Why would someone do that? It gets even weirder. It was scratched in there by Charles Darwin. Boom. And that's how the chapter ends. There are a whole bunch of vocabulary words. Oh my goodness. Let me hit these really fast. I'm so sorry. First one's rickety, not stable, rocking. Um, gone to his head something kind of took over your brain and you just kind of got passionate for it and you let your passion take over um, circumnavigate is to navigate around um, mutiny means to overthrow the captain of the ship um, hucksters and I couldn't um, I forgot to actually look this one up because I have no idea what it means um, please look it up for yourself and write the definition in the YouTube comments. I imagine it means um, low life, uh, something like that. 
tendrils or um, imagine like an octopus or a squid their legs are tendrils and so the fog was tendriling out of the darkness um, a brusque is kind of strong heavy rough emaciated emaciated is um unusually weak or thin uh, Darwin looked pretty strong and th um, healthy when he left but now he looked thin and like he lost 30 pounds feral is wild um, not tame we say like a feral cat is a cat without any owner living in the woods and things deranged is crazy mooring lines are um, the rope alongside of the edge of a boat that kind of connects it to the dock so that way it won't uh, float away commission means to um, charge or ask someone to build something and um, like maybe you can commission an artist to draw a, pig, a painting and you just give that artist some money and they do a painting for you curio cabinets these are kind of some special cabinets that Charles um, had created so he can store all his um, specimens and things that he collected facade is a mask and so when uh, Fritz Roy sees this abomination he pretends oh yeah that's exciting a front is like something disgusting or repulsive oh maybe if uh, a little kid came up to you and had like some uh, boogers in their hand and said you want to eat some boogers you know oh disgusting <laughs> well whatever darwin found was an affront to god oh i don't know that's what fitzroy thinks um rookeries uh those are the places that the seals i believe are sleeping and staying and probably have their babies devoid is without um, I can't remember how she used it here. Sorry. Uh, endemic means belonging to the native people. So the endemic people of the um, Isla Isabella Island. And the last one. I, oh, okay. That was the last one. Perfect. All right. Lastly, discussion question, what did Darwin find? What was the affront to God and that Fritz Roy threw over the ship? Of course, please make your own discussion question. That is all the time that we have for today. But thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Book Club Preview. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, if you have any questions about the video today, uh, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. If you had any other vocabulary words that you wanted to know what they meant, uh, let me know. And also, if you're interested in maybe joining one of these book clubs, um, please leave a comment and I'll get back to you. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.